Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today, we visit the nation's capital area to learn about the Genealogical Institute on Federal Records with its director, Melissa Ruffner. Melissa, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Thank you for having me. Melissa, let's get started by having you give us an overview of what GenFed is. GenFed, which is the short name of the Genealogical Institute on Federal Records, is a week-long institute that's held at the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C., um, although we do spend one day out in College Park, Maryland. And the focus of this institute is on federal records, and it's designed to assist intermediate and advanced researchers make the most of federal records, both in terms of its sort of traditional genealogical value and in records that shed contextual light on our ancestors' lives. Uh, It's one of the oldest, it is the oldest genealogical institute in the country. It was recently renamed from its previous incarnation as the National Institute on Genealogical Research. So we are this year for the first time hosting students from 18 different states at the first session of the Genealogical Institute on Federal Records, July 11th through 15th in Washington, D.C. So let's dive into the history a little bit. You said it was one of the oldest, or if not the oldest, institute. When did it form? Um, How did it form? What was it called when it first started? When it first started, which was uh, the first session was held in 1950, and it began really with a connection with the American University. It was a three-week course, if you can imagine. People came to the area for three weeks, and it was the brainchild of Meredith Colquette, who was a National Archives employee, and he was also involved, uh, an officer of the American Society of Genealogists, ASG. And at that time, the name was the Institute on Methods of Genealogical Research. And it really covered genealogically broadly. I've seen notes and syllabus from that session, and it really is was covered all aspects of genealogy, uh, not just federal records. The focus didn't come until much later. Then it became, at one point, the Institute on Genealogical Research, And then the National Archives became a co-sponsor. It's been through a number of iterations. And then in 1972, the National Archives took it over. And at that time, that's when the word national was added to its name. So at that time, it was the National Institute on Genealogical Research. When the National Archives, I think because of some budget woes, you know, had to sort of let go of the program, that's when the genealogical community stepped in. ASG, FGS, APG, and BCG, and NGS all stepped in to co-sponsor the Institute. So those organizations remain our co-sponsors, and representatives of those organizations all serve on a board of trustees that oversees the Institute. Now, this happens only once a year, so it's just one week out of the whole entire year. That's correct. It's traditionally been held in, in July, and uh, although I think in 1976 there might have been an extra session that was added in January, and over the years there's certainly been, you know, thoughts about maybe we could add another week, but it is um, a great deal of work to put it together, and so far we're sticking with the one-week schedule. How many students are able to attend? Is there a cap that you only allow so many students in? Well, it really depends on the capacity of the room. The last 10 years or so, the number attending has been about 44. I'm keeping the enrollment this year at 40 because we're uh, meeting in a room that we've never used before, and I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work. So it's possible the number could go up a bit in the next few years, maybe back up to the sort of traditional 44. But again, it's going to depend on how the room works. We're actually meeting this year in the Innovation Hub, which is designed to foster collaboration and innovation. And we're really excited that NARA has made this room available to us. I was just there yesterday sort of talking about how the room is going to be set up. And it's right in the middle of the research areas in what was formerly 
for those who have been to the National Archives in what was the library. So it is really a great central location for the Institute. Can you give us a sense of what people learn in the week that they're in Washington in this program? We're shifting focus a little bit and really focusing on what people can only accomplish on site at the National Archives. Obviously, there's been a huge change in the last 10 years in terms of access to federal records. With NARA's partnerships with the various companies, Fold3, also with FamilySearch and Ancestry, our access to sort of basic records have really, you know, changed over the years. So like, for instance, 20 years ago, they might be having lectures on census records. These days, that's something that's dropped from our program because people, intermediate genealogists or people with uh, experience who are attending these at this point should have a pretty good handle on things like census records and basic, very basic military type records or passenger lists. With that taken off the table, we're able to delve into some of the lesser known record types. Now, the program this year, we're going to spend Monday, I've been referring to it as Methodological Monday or Methodology Monday. We're we're not going to be really looking at types of records that day. We're going to be looking at how people can learn about a particular topic and identify records that would be of interest to them. So we'll be covering finding aids. We'll also be talking about the catalog and the changes in the catalog over the last few years and how those two tools can be used together. We'll be talking about the overall system, you know, nationwide of repositories. Obviously, NARA is in more places than just, you know, Washington, D.C. And we'll really be trying to increase people's ability to think about how their ancestors would have interacted with the federal government. So we've got Methodology Monday. What does the rest of the week look like? We actually did a survey of our alumni last summer. The survey indicated that the program was basically very solid in terms of the framework so that we do keep our focus on lectures. Now, it's a balance between lecture time and research time. In years past, when NARA was open in the evening, it was possible to have lectures, you know, all day and people could research in the evening. That's that's no longer possible. But we still on Tuesdays and Wednesdays have sort of traditional lectures on land records and military records. We'll be having lectures on Wednesday on immigration and naturalization documents, sort of beyond the basic passenger list type documents. And then on Thursday, we have a field trip. We have a bus that takes us out to College Park, Archives 2, where there are the State Department records and where there are photographs and maps and modern military records. So World War II research uh, records are all out at Archives 2. And so we have a few lectures out there in the morning, and then people have the option of coming back downtown or staying out and research there. And then on Friday, uh, we finish up with some sort of specialized records and then close by five o'clock on Friday afternoon. Most of the time people will be in lectures, but I'm trying to arrange for sort of long sessions or long lunch breaks in the middle of the day in which people are welcome to gobble down their lunch and then go to the research room, have records pulled for them to look at. And then we encourage people to stay through Saturday and take advantage of the research room on Saturday as well. How many instructors does it take to pull this off? Are there there multiple instructors that specialize in certain topics? We have a couple of non-NARA people who are doing like land records and military records. We do have a number of the NARA staff and also staff from the USCIS coming in to talk about immigration and nationality and some retired NARA individuals who have a lot of institutional memory and are, you know, willing to come back and share that information. So I don't, it's probably about eight to 10 different lectures during the week. We also have two evening sessions, uh, one to introduce folks to the DAR library, and then another to introduce people to the genealogy and local history resources at the Library of Congress. So is there a a prerequisite for students to get into the program? There is not a prerequisite. I mean, we have sort of a little test that I published in our news section about questions you could ask yourself about whether or not you were ready to attend GenFed. 
I would say that it's probably not the best first institute. Uh, if you've never attended an institute, it might not be the best choice. But if you, and if it might not be the best choice if you'd never been to a repository where you were using finding aids and submitting pull slips. So there's a way to, I think, to identify whether or not you're ready for GenFed. The fact is, though, you could get something out of it, and no matter what level you come in, and people, you know, in the past certainly have returned after a number of years because oftentimes, as we all know, when you hear uh, something the second time, it, it, you know, it resonates in a different way. So there are people who have repeated it, but the, the basic program doesn't really change all that much. Perhaps the people who are attending change in terms of their capacity to sort of understand and be able to take it to the next level. It can be a little intimidating to come into the National Archives and you, you need to be able to, you know, work directly with archivists and, and roll with the punches to some extent because it's a process. It's not simple necessarily to pull it off, but you, you can come in with a checklist of sort of things that you know you should be looking at. You have to be, I think it's best to prepare some before you come. I've been encouraging our current enrollees for this year to really review their own research files and and think about what men or women might have served in the military or think about migration routes or think about occupations so that they're ready when suggestions are made to them they're ready with their information to sort of try out different theories and possibilities for finding their ancestors in federal records so it's best to have some time to think about it ahead of time before I will go to an archive, I'll go online and I'll use their electronic catalog to first understand what they have, broadly speaking, and then I'll look specifically to see if they have, uh, I'll do like keyword searches to see if I'm going to find the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. Is there a, a place that somebody could go to kind of get an overview of the stuff they may not be familiar with, but would be good to know about just to kind of do what you said? assess their ancestors and see if there's any sort of fit with what they might find. There is a book, Genealogical Research at the National Archives. It's a third edition. It doesn't have information on the most recent censuses that have been released or a lot of information about what's online. So that would be the starting point. Really, every genealogist should probably take a look at at, at that book at some point, finding it in a local library. I've seen used copies on Amazon. It can be ordered from the National Archives. And I do uh, suggest it to our attendees in terms of something that they might consider reading ahead of time before they come. Some of these things are, they're so complex. You know, you're going to need to hear about something multiple times before it really sinks in. And so if they have a chance to read this and then they come in and actually hear some lectures, that is the go-to book. And really every genealogist at some point or another should probably take a look at that book. It is published by the National Archives. I was Googling that book and mm -hmm. I found actually a, a web page on the National Archives. It's called uh, Resources for Genealogists, which seems to kind of uh, bring people in at a, a broad overview as well. There's a lot of text on the website. There's also a larger three-volume guide to federal records, which people may have seen in, you know, on reference shelves in libraries. That is actually online, and you probably see a link to that. You know, it's organized by Record Group, and you can really search that and get good descriptions of what the holdings are. So that's a sort of a bigger book. It's not, a, it's not focused specifically on genealogy, but that's sort of the larger guide to federal records. Let's talk logistics. Give us a sense of where the students stay. Do they find their own accommodations? Are they given time to go off on their own to get their food? How, how does it logistically work? We do have a block of rooms at the Holiday Inn Capitol, which is one metro stop away. But also, it's a, I think it's about 0.6 miles. So you can walk from the hotel to the National Archives across the mall, which is pretty thrilling in and of itself. Or you can take the metro some students who live nearby are going to be commuting from home, and another handful have made other arrangements. Perhaps they have friends in the area or something like that. But most of the people who are attending this year are staying at the Holiday Inn. That's where I'm staying as well, and we'll have a session on Sunday night before the Institute starts on Monday morning to distribute the course notebook and go over rules and answer as many questions as we can so that we can sort of hit the ground running on Monday. There's a luncheon on Monday for all the students sort of in the classroom. So they won't be out foraging for lunch until 
Tuesday evenings, all the meals, they're on their own for that. The two evening activities that are at the DAR library and the Library of Congress, they will have to go by foot or use public transportation or cabs. And we'll be talking, obviously, about that on Sunday night, how people will be getting around. I think one of the biggest things you learn staying in Washington for a week is how to, how to use the metro. And for a lot of people, that will be uh, a new experience. The DAR is a little bit of a distance. Uh, I suspect there'll be more cabs involved in getting to the DAR library. But for our trip out to College Park, um, we do have a bus. There's a dinner on um, Friday night that is not included in the course tuition fee, but it is hosted by this, uh, the Alumni Association that I mentioned earlier. So that's sort of a little bit of a culminating event. But people are on their own in terms of, you know, obviously making arrangements for, you know, getting to Washington, D.C., but we're certainly aimed to be of assistance and answer all those questions as best we can. All right. So the the upshot of that is people should bring comfortable shoes. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. And a sweater as we, you know, move from research areas to outside Washington, D.C., and an umbrella. (laughs) You said that the Institute in 2016 is in July. What are the dates of that again? We'll start the, you know, we'll kick off with the meeting on Sunday night, July 10th at the hotel and open at the National Archives on July 11th. The 15th is Friday and the dinner is that night. Then, you know, we're encouraging people to stay through on the 16th. The APG National Capital Area holds its meetings on that Saturday, and it's actually at the National Archives. So if people are there doing research, they'll be welcome to attend that APG meeting and meet other local professional genealogists. And does the Institute happen the same week every year? It is always, it has been for the last probably 30 years, always about the same time. I think one year they had it in June but it's typically in July. Now, we're, we're having to sort of check with each other now, you know, directors of various institutes, because with the very successful GRIP, you know, Elisa Powell and I are, are in touch about what dates they're looking at and what dates we're looking at. We have a couple of other considerations. We want to make sure that we're not meeting the week during an important DAR meeting, because we'd like to be able to go to the DAR library. I think next week, Next year, you know, I haven't actually made the official request to NARA, but I'd be looking at uh, the exact same week next year, except shifted by a day. And we held our registration online for the first time this year. It was another big change in the process. We held it the last Saturday in February of 2016, and I don't anticipate a change really in that plan. If people want to keep up with news about the Institute and when registration is coming, they can go to the website, www.gen-fed.org. There is a subscribe button on the box on the bottom right side of each web page where they can enter their email address, and then they will get all of the posts um, and announcements about when registration is coming. And that's the best way to sort of keep in touch with what we're thinking about next year. Okay, and that subscribe button is right at the bottom of the front page so yes it could be on the other pages too it just just it, it is it um, is on the yeah it's yeah it's right there page. on the front so don't even go poking around just scroll down and you'll see it <laughs> well you can go poking around yeah 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 go poking you. around after get your email address in there first and then right. go poking around how quickly does it sell out well i only have the one year um experience in terms of online okay we had a very happy circumstance this year. Really, everyone who was watching for the announcement and who was anxious to enroll was able to enroll on the first day. We actually sold out in about 26 hours. See, that's important to know. <laughs> it is. I, I don't, I, and I just, I guess I don't know uh, what will happen next year, okay. whether or not there will be more people there, you know, hovering with their hand on the, the button. It had always been a print application or registration process paper brochures were mailed out to people who had expressed an interest. And they really went to a lot of trouble to make sure that it reached various parts. They would mail the peop- uh, to the people in California sooner than the people, you know, who were sort of in the same area to, to try to keep it balanced and, and fair. But at this point in this day and age, we went with an online registration, which has allowed us to spend money on things other than postage for, and printing of paper brochures. All right. So the upshot of that is... If you want to go to GenFed next year or in the coming years, make sure you subscribe on the website 
and you mentally make note of that final week in February of when they're going to open up registration. Be on top of that and make sure that you get registered fairly quickly because two weeks after registration, you're probably not going to get a slot. Melissa, is there anything we haven't covered that's important for people to know about the Institute? I think that people should take a look at the history on the website. I would have loved to have posted a a list of all of the illustrious people that have been involved in this institute. It really is amazing. I was afraid I would leave someone out, so I didn't want to do that. It really has a unique place in, in terms of the institutes, and it's the only one that really focuses on a particular kind of record and it's you know it's not multiple courses so it's really just this you know this one week and this one focus there's some wonderful blog posts out there and i I, i'd link to some of them from some of our news articles if you go back and read our news posts many people have found it a very important week in their development as a genealogist it looks to me as though people have really come away bonded with a different group of people than they'd ever met before. We also have people who come who are librarians themselves. We will have people in the class who were on the staff, one person from DAR and one person from the Library of Congress. So we have a lot of people learning from each other in the class. So people should be prepared to, you know, work collaboratively and brainstorm with the teachers and with the archivist and with each other to get the most out of it that they can. We have experts on particular kind of records, but those experts would all tell you that they are always learning something new, particularly in the way that access is changing. It's really not possible for one person to sort of even know a particular type of record to the exclusion of you know all others. It's just people have to share information in order to be able to work effectively there. I was just there yesterday and I pulled several different kinds of records that I'd never seen before. I was definitely swinging for the fences on a couple of them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I maybe batted about a 360, so that's not too bad. But it is exciting to be in Washington and to be in the middle of all the history. We would like people to take advantage of, uh, you know, the location to maybe see some other sites. We're actually offering one of our graduates of the Institute who lives nearby and who is a trained tour guide is going to be offering a walking tour one night with the comfortable shoes um, so that people can, you know, get a sense of not just the building, the National Archives, but what's around it. It's really a thrilling place to be. It seems that for anybody who's interested in the Institute, one of the most important parts of the website is the news section. I would really recommend that anybody who wants to know more information go to that. That's where that questionnaire is that Melissa mentioned that says, are you ready for Gen Fed? It has a bunch of questions listed. And there's uh, details about all the speakers there. I see Judy Russell and Marion Smith, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, One thing I'd like you to talk about a little bit is the scholarship. How would somebody take advantage of that? Well, there are two scholarships. The one is the Lackey Scholarship, and that is sponsored by the Alumni Association. We actually had a record sort of number of applicants this year. Um, Angela Lucas uh, was the winner, and she will be attending. The details on that, again, will be announced through the website, and it is offered to somebody who works either in a paid position or in a volunteer position with a genealogical organization or library or archives. They're particularly interested in uh, having someone who is in a position who could pass on information to other people. So, you know, train the trainer point of view. That process will be probably announced late this year. You know, for next year will be announced late this year or early next year. We will be trying to do it a little bit earlier, I think, than we did it this year. So um, that's the Lackey Scholarship. That information is on the website under, I think there's a tab under for scholarships under About Gen Fed. There's also a neat page, Tales of Discovery, where some of our alumni shared some of their special finds with us in that survey. The other scholarship is one that is sponsored by the American Society of Genealogists, and the winner has the option of using it at at several different institutes. Last year's winner had already attended. Um, Darcy Pose had already attended what was GenFed, so uh, I'm not sure what she's using her scholarship money for, but that takes place well in advance of the registration for 
gen fed and this year it's not actually being used at the institute but perhaps next year it will be the lackey scholarship winner actually has a spot saved in registration for that winner so the person who wins the scholarship does not need to worry about being at their computer pressing a button which might be one of the largest benefits you know in the coming years actually of winning the scholarship well this has been a great overview of the Genealogical Institute on Federal Records. Melissa, I'm so happy that you were able to spend some time telling us about it, especially in this transition as the name has changed. Can you give us any parting words for our listeners, either words of encouragement or advice if they want to attend? Well, certainly pay attention to what's going on. It's it's really a great experience. I'm hoping that as many people that want to take advantage of it will be able to take advantage of it. I can't promise that if the demand you know, overcame what we were able to do that we could expand it, but I suppose all things are possible. You know, we could perhaps take a little bit of a sh- the show on the road or something like that. I think, you know, I think that we've, we're entering a new era. In, in terms of where GenFed is going, you know, obviously at this point, I'm really focused on sort of the many details of what's going to happen in July. I've got lists and lists and lists of lists and things like that. But, you know, once we get through it and we see how it works in its new location, I think we'll be able to sort of look back and think about and brainstorm as a community about what other ways we could use it to help as many genealogists as possible. Melissa Ruffner, thank you so much for being on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Genealogical Institute on Federal Records from its director, Melissa Ruffner. As part of your business, it's important to understand what professional development opportunities are available to you. We'll continue to bring you updates on occasion about the various institutes available to the genealogical community. While you can't attend GenFed this year because it's underway this week, you can get prepared by signing up for their newsletter and marking off the last week of February in your calendar so that you know to register for next year. In genealogy news, just a quick reminder that we are in the final week to register for the APG Professional Management Conference at the early bird rate. This episode is releasing on July 10th, And you only have until July 15th, 2016 to save money. I did a quick survey on my personal Facebook wall about who has already registered, and I was pleasantly surprised by how many people have signed up. You'll be able to register after July 15th, but you'll have to pay full conference price. You can find more information out at www.apgen.org forward slash conferences. If you'd like to become a supporter of the Genealogy Professional Podcast, head over to the website at thegenealogyprofessional.com and click on the supporter button. And of course, ratings and reviews in both iTunes and Stitcher are always welcome. As always, I will leave you with an action item for today, though it's not directly related to GenFed or the National Archives. What I'd like you to do is to choose an archives or library in your local area that you've never been to before. Then spend some time exploring their online catalog and guidance resources. Try to get an overview of what records and resources they have available. Next, if possible, try to explore some specific genealogical searches and see if the archives has records that might help you in your research. If so, Make a research plan and then plan a visit. If not, see if you can plan a visit anyway and see if what you learned online about the archives matches what you discover in person. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media, copyright 2016. Executive producer, Marianne Pierre-Louis. Creative producer, George Edwards. Production assistant, Pam Wolos. Technical director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis, Jr.